Agricultural Inputs, Section 2. We're going to talk a little about traditional agricultural inputs here. Um, in large-scale agriculture in developed countries, the most important inputs are usually fertilizer, pesticides, and irrigation. Soil amendments are usually added as either cover crops or crop residue um, and uh, manure. The most important qualities of fertilizers and pesticides um, in large-scale agriculture, um, other than obviously effectiveness, um, are cost and ease of application. Um, this has resulted in chemical fertilizers and pesticides overwhelmingly dominating the market because chemical products like that can be manufactured to a very consistent size and potency in the case of granular stuff um, and absolute potency uh, control in the case of liquids, um, making application easier and faster. In addition, large scale manufacturing also reduces the cost. So we have a twofold effect driving down the cost of uh, chemical fertilizers and pesticides. So we're going to deal with the issues involved with traditional agricultural inputs. Um, and the various inputs used in large scale agriculture aren't without issues or problems. Um, the problems include greenhouse gas production, transportation issues, soil structure and fertility problems, pollution at the point of use uh, through drift due to wind, runoff, uh, application to non-target areas. Um, and additional issues are due to the toxicity of some of the products used, um, which can make areas of application uh, dangerous for humans and animals for a period of time following the application um, typically called on uh, pesticide labels the re-entry time. Um, the next few slides will describe some of the problems um, with the use of various inputs in traditional large-scale agriculture. Fertilizers designed for low cost ease of application and ease of uptake by the plants can result in rapid changes in soil chemistry resulting in poor conditions for beneficial soil microbes. Um, this has a great effect on uh, soil structure because microbes help build that soil structure. They also help break down organic material in the soil, such as green manures and crop residue and that sort of thing. Um, and so by uh, curtailing the activity of these soil microbes, we can um, actually be damaging the soil um, as we add fertilizers. Um, common fertilizers can also result in long-term changes in soil chemistry uh, and structure. And such changes are rarely beneficial uh, and must be counteracted to maintain quality soil and fertility. Such fertilizers are also easy uh, to move through the soil they move readily through the soil so they can uh, be in the root zones where they can be easily uptake, you know, the plants can easily take up the nutrients. Um, but that means they can also run off into nearby waters, lakes, ponds, streams, whatever. Um, and the manufacture of fertilizers is a centralized process which produces large quantities of greenhouse gases and then require shipping to the end user, resulting in the production of more greenhouse gases. And most of uh, the large scale fertilizers are derived from petroleum products, um, resulting in the release of yet more greenhouse gases. Um, fertilizer runoff can cause eutrophication, um, also referred to as hypertrophication, um, and it's often evidenced by algal or cyanobacterial blooms. Um, you can see in this uh, photograph the green color of the water and, and the various shades of green. 
Um, it's not the water, it's the result of um, billions and billions of uh, cyanobacteria in the water. They're multiplying because of uh, the amount of nutrients in the water that have run off from surrounding fields. Um, the nutrient levels in the water rise rapidly when runoff like this occurs. The uh, cyanobacteria that are naturally existing in the water explode in population, coloring the water green like this. Um, they also then fairly rapidly use up the nutrients uh, that have flowed into the water. And those nutrients are not sufficient to support the population of bacteria, cyanobacteria that have exploded, essentially. And so the bacteria begin to die. And as they die and decompose, the process of decomposition uses up the free oxygen in the water, often resulting in the death of fish and other aquatic life. Pesticides have issues, and we're going to look at pesticides here as two main groups, insecticides and herbicides. Insecticides are things which kill insects. Um, those substances for the control of non-insect pests, such as mites and nematodes, are often referred to as insecticides as well, and we're going to lump them in that category here. Um, most insecticides are broad spectrum, meaning they kill more than one type of insect. They, they kill pretty much any type of insect they land on, um, or if the insect consumes it. Um, many of these insecticides um, don't differentiate. They have no way of differentiating between a harmful insect and a beneficial insect, such as a pollinator or a ladybug, which consumes lots and lots of aphids or that sort of thing. Um, and most insecticides are also poisonous to humans and animals. Issues with insecticides are caused by application to non-target areas, meaning it ends up in a place that you didn't intend it to end up, effects that they have on non-target species, and resistance. We'll look at each of those. Application to non-target areas. When insecticides are applied, care must be taken to make sure they are applied only on target areas. Sounds simple enough, but it can be complicated by several factors. First, drift. Insecticides may be blown by wind into non-target areas. Not even wind, necessarily, as a... Uh, large piece of farm machinery is going along spraying insecticides out. Um, the air turbulence created simply by the force of the spray and by the machinery itself may cause some degree of drift. Runoff. Insecticides may be washed off the target areas by rain or irrigation and then move to non-target areas um, such as streams and ponds and lakes, um, ditches and other down slope areas. Um, an improper application technique, improperly adjusted or faulty equipment or poor application training can exacerbate both drift and runoff. And occasionally with a poorly trained operator, they may simply apply the insecticide um, to the wrong area. When insecticides make it to non-target areas, they can threaten non-target species. They can poison waterways, and they can make such areas dangerous for other animals, and including humans, to enter that area. Um, the EPA reports that one or more pesticides was present in water 90% of the time when they tested, in fish samples 80% of the time when tested, and 33% of the time in major aquifers. So pick a, uh, a, a body of water, a stream, a lake, a pond, and 90% of the time when they're, when they're tested, they'll contain some pesticides. And 80% of fish from whatever body of water. 
and in major aquifers, which we depend on for our drinking water, 33% um, of the time. The effects on non-target species? Well, even when they're properly applied and confined to target areas, insecticides may still affect non-target species. Um, insecticides applied directly to crops may kill bees and other pollinators. Um, they may affect beneficial insects like ladybugs and praying mantises and lacewings, um, which we mentioned earlier as biocontrols. Um, even if the insects are not killed outright, insecticides can accumulate in the tissues of non-target species, uh, making them weaker and more susceptible to disease or environmental stress. And insecticides designed for foliar application, which means spraying onto leaves, may still have potency in the soil and can affect beneficial soil organisms uh, that we would like to have to help build soil structure. Um, in addition, uh, insects that are target species that we did want to control with the insecticide are then sometimes after being sprayed, eaten by non-target species um, and not just insects, but birds and mammals and things like that. So the effect um, moves up the food chain. Um, finally, we'll talk here about resistance. When insecticides are applied over a period of time, insects can develop resistance to those pesticides. Um, that happens this way. In any given population of insect, hundreds, thousands, millions of insects in an area, some of those insects will be less affected by any given pesticide. It's just the way things work. So if these insects survive the application and breed, their offspring are more likely to have the same or even greater resistance to that pesticide. Whereas the insects that could be easily killed by that pesticide are what? Easily killed and don't breed. So each new generation has greater resistance to the pesticide. This is simply the process of natural selection at work. What that means is we may have to use greater doses, more potency in the, in the application, apply more frequently, or use different pest insecticides because one is not as effective anymore. Um, Depending on the source that we go to for information on this, it's estimated that 500 to 1,000 species of insects have developed resistance to insecticides since the 1940s, which is when insecticides began being used in large scale on uh, developed uh, country agriculture. Herbicide issues. The issues related to herbicides reflect those related to insecticides, application in non-target areas, effect on non-target species, and resistance. Herbicides on non-target areas, like insecticides, herbicides can end up in non-target areas for a variety of reasons. The same things that cause, it, cause insecticides to end up where they shouldn't can cause herbicides to end up where they shouldn't. When herbicides hit non-target areas, they may kill or damage plants that we didn't intend to kill. A common example is damage to nearby flowers, shrubs, or vegetables when weed killer is applied to turf areas in a lawn. The same thing can happen on agricultural land. Broadleaf herbicides applied to corn may drift to an adjacent soybean field and kill or damage soybean plants. Um, they may drift to uh, um, non-cropland areas surrounding uh, the cornfield and, and kill or damage um, broadleaf plants, trees, shrubs, uh, wildflowers, and that sort of thing surrounding the fields. Effects on non-target species? Well, broad-spectrum herbicides such as 2,4-D, which is a broadleaf herbicide, it kills broadleaf plants as opposed to narrow-leaf plants such as grasses or Roundup, which is a non-selective herbicide and kills everything it's sprayed on, cause the same damage on non-target plants as they do on target species, 
if they land on those non-target plants. And some herbicides can be very persistent in the environment and present problems even when they're properly applied. Um, clopyrrolid is an herbicide used to control thistles, clover, and dandelions. It is um, often sprayed on uh, pastures where cows will graze um, and often used as well on lawns, uh, golf, course, golf courses, uh, home lawns, that sort of thing. Um, if the grass clippings from the uh, area sprayed by the herbicide are made into compost, the herbicide retains its potency. If that compost is then applied to a garden, vegetable garden, flower garden, whatever, um, the plants in that garden can be killed or damaged by the, comp by the active um, clopyrrolid still existing in the compost. Pichlorum is another herbicide that's used on hay fields. So farmers need to grow some hay, harvest it, and put it aside for winter to feed their cattle. And compost made from cow and horse manure um, for cows and horses fed on hay from fields where pichlorum was used um, has been shown to kill and damage flower and vegetable plants um, after the herbicide persisted um, both through the digestive processes of the animals and the composting process. Effects on animals. Herbicides are designed to control plants, but many are still quite dangerous to animal life as well. In concentrated form, many herbicides are poisonous to humans or may cause irreversible damage to skin or eyes, uh, being corrosive. In dilute form, as they are applied, Danger is less, but still exists, especially for animals that may feed or graze on fields where the herbicides have been applied. Resistance. Plants can develop resistance to herbicides just as insects develop resistance to insecticides, or bacteria develop resistance to antibiotics. According to weedscience.org, there are 217 species of plants that have shown resistance to herbicides globally. 129 dicot species, primarily the broadleaves that we're talking about, and 88 monocot species, primarily the grasses. The result of this is that new herbicides must be continually developed to control species that have become resistant to our existing controls. Irrigation issues. I mean, how can this be harmful? Irrigation seems like a harmless enough practice. After all, we're only applying water, not insecticides or herbicides. But there are numerous issues with irrigation, and many are serious. Water used in irrigation can contain high levels of dissolved minerals and salts. This is particularly true of water from ground sources, large aquifers, um, but can be true of water from almost any source. Um, those dissolved minerals and salts can damage soil structure and cause dramatic changes in soil pH and soil chemistry. Um, you may have seen, for instance, uh, house plants or plants grown in clay pots um, continually watered with tap water, and you'll see white crust form either on the surface of the soil or on the clay pot itself. That white crust is due to minerals dissolved in the water beginning to accumulate. Um, in addition, using water for irrigation can dramatically deplete water supplies, not only from aquifers, but also from lakes and rivers. And we'll take a look at some of those issues uh, in the next set of slides for uh, irrigation. Soil changes. Soil changes due to irrigation happen anytime 
irrigation is used. Even the best quality fresh water contains some dissolved salts and minerals. The quantity of dissolved salts in irrigation water might be small, but the effect when irrigation is done on a large scale or is the primary source of water for growing a crop, the effect is huge. The water at the soil surface may evaporate, but the dissolved salts remain. The accumulation of salt through a variety of means can damage soil structure so that the movement of water, air, and nutrients through the soil is severely inhibited. Water from wells, particularly in arid and semi-arid regions, often contain high levels of dissolved minerals and salts, making the situation even worse since these areas have little rainfall to help leach the salts and minerals from the soil. Um, I'll explain leaching here a little bit. Leaching is the process by which, um, say, rainfall dissolves some of those salts and minerals from the soil and washes it away. Where does it wash to? Uh, some of it will wash through the soil structure and into nearby um, bodies of water, streams, ponds, and lakes. Um, some will simply be carried down deeper and deeper into the soil um, below the level of the topsoil, but may still accumulate in a layer there, um, resulting in a hard, um, impermeable layer below the topsoil. Depletion of water from irrigation. Uh, there was a time when we never thought this could happen, but uh, we're seeing that that's simply not the case. Water can be depleted from both underground supplies, or aquifers, and surface supplies, such as rivers, lakes, and reservoirs. Agricultural use accounts for 80% of all water consumption in the United States and over 90% of water use in some Western states. That's a huge number. In many areas of the country, the current level of water use is not sustainable because the water is being drawn from water sources at a much higher rate than those sources are re being recharged by rain or snowmelt. We'll take a look here at the Ogallala Aquifer. The, Ola, the Ogallala Aquifer is the source of much water used for irrigation on the high plains of the United States. It's also the source of water, drinking water, for many of the cities in those same areas. The water levels in many areas of the aquifer is declining at an alarming rate. Um, some reports say that the water may be insufficient to sustain current levels of use in, in as little as 25 years. Now, we'll look at this next slide. Now, take a look. Here we see the extent of the Ogallala Aquifer. It goes from South Dakota all the way to Texas. It includes Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, and as we said, South Dakota and Texas. These areas in gray on the map are areas that are showing um, an insignificant change in the water levels in the aquifers. Areas shown in blue are areas that are showing an actual increase of water levels in the aquifers. But in between all of these shades of yellow, orange, red, and brown are areas of decline in the amount of water in the aquifer. Okay, and these are, um, these numbers are measured in feet, by the way. So, um, in, take a look over here, uh, at more than 40 feet. Okay, so in these areas, 
of this dark reddish, the aquifer has declined by more than 40 feet. You have to drill wells more than 40 feet deeper to hit water in those areas. In these brown areas, which you see are, are concentrated kind of along the western side of the aquifer, there's little or no saturation left, meaning the aquifer is dry in those areas already. So, uh, and these are changes only from 1980 to 1995. The problems have only uh, increased or accelerated since then. <coughs> okay, this is an underground source of water. What about surface sources of water? The Colorado River. The Colorado River arises in Colorado at an elevation of over 10,000 feet. So up in the mountains in Colorado, um, snow melt gives rise <clears throat> to various streams which come together and form the Colorado River. Some of its tributaries include the Gunnison River, the Green River, San Juan, and Gila Rivers. 80 to 85 percent of its water comes from snow melt. It flows through the states of Colorado, Utah, Arizona, Nevada, California, and into Mexico before discharging into the Gulf of California. In its natural state, it discharged an average of about 21,700 cubic feet per second into the Gulf of California. The Colorado River has been extensively dammed to form reservoirs and supplies water for agriculture and urban areas all along its course, and even hundreds of miles from its course. In most years since 1960, the river has been dry before reaching the Gulf. This shows the drainage area of the Colorado River. And if uh, you look down here in the lower left corner, this is the area in which it flows through Mexico and into the Gulf of California. <clears throat> A river that undammed discharged 21,700 cubic feet per second of water into the Gulf of California, now in most years, is dry before it reaches the Gulf. This has effects not only on the land areas surrounding the river, but on the Gulf itself. It changes the water chemistry of the Gulf um, and the Gulf is, uh, for instance, a breeding ground for uh, whales and a feeding area for whales. Um, it's uh, a commercial fishery, but that's being changed. Let's take a quick look here at California's Imperial Valley. The Imperial Valley in California is one of the most productive agricultural areas in the world. Its sole source of water for irrigation is the Colorado River. Without irrigation, the Imperial Valley is a desert. It is not an agricultural area. It is 100% dependent upon irrigation and its sole source of irrigation water is the Colorado River. So surface water is being actively depleted as much as um, aquifer water. 